Hey, everybody. Welcome again to another episode of the Shop Notes podcast. It's your usual suspects here, John, Logan, Phil. Today is episode number 93. And on this episode, we will discuss such topics as Phil Turns all by himself and woodworking tool super friends. I want to remind you that today's episode is brought to you by Shaper Tools. They're the makers of the Shaper Origin, a handheld CNC router that brings digital precision to the craft of woodworking. Tackle joinery, cabinetry, hardware installation, and more with speed and precision. Try it risk-free in your shop for 30 days. Visit shapertools.com to learn more. So I'm closing in on my Christmas projects. Yeah, Brian. Yep. And one of the projects that I'm working on for my daughter required a turned part. And it was just kind of fun to think to myself, because at first I was like, oh, crap, now I got to find a 7 8 inch dowel and then a larger dowel to make a cap for it and all that kind of stuff. And then I thought, I'll just turn it. Mm -hmm. I can do that. Yeah. When you have a lathe, everything's a dowel. <laughs> <laughs> Even dowels. You can just make them Even smaller, dowels. Even dowels. smaller dowels. Yes. You reduce the size. <laughs> so anyway, it was just kind of fun to be able to just cut out a blank on the bandsaw, pop it in the lathe, and then using... Uh, because I'm that kind of turner, mm -hmm. I was using carbide tools. No shame for me. So I uh, was able to quickly and easily shape the part that I needed, which was kind of cool. So still is not something that I necessarily want a lathe in my own shop or to get into turning, but it's nice having tried something and having the tools that will give you a reasonable amount of success mm -hmm. without a steep learning curve like that. Yeah. So that if there are a couple of parts where I need or would want them turned, I can do it. So, so theoretically you don't work at Woodsmith anymore. You don't work at popular woodworking. You don't have our big shop. Yeah. Do you, Add a small mini lathe to your shop. That's a no. That's a no. I know that. Yeah. I know that because I my wife gives me that answer all the time. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. It's like a little yeah. pause and it's like, you know the right answer. Just you, you know what I'm it. gonna say. You already you, have that answer. Yes. Yeah. Think about yeah. it. If you already know the answer, why are you asking me the question? Uh, that's true. That's fair. Uh I don't think I would. But I would like to know somebody who had a lathe. Yeah, that would be fair. Um, and I realize that it's easy to be blinded by your current situation in a lot of things. But to narrow it down to woodworking, uh, I'm around woodworkers a lot, oddly enough. So it's nice to and easy to get used to having a spray booth or somebody who knows how to turn that I can ask questions to or, uh, you know, access to other tools or design ideas that I can bounce around. But I would like to think that whenever the time comes that I'm not here, that I would be able to cultivate that kind of woodworking network, so to speak, that I could uh, have access to some of those things mm -hmm. in a in a broader woodworking community without wanting to get all 1970s commune about it. So, so your words of wisdom are find friends that have the tools that you want or that right. you don't want, but you want to be able to have access to. Sure. I can see that. On um, that note, never allow Phil to borrow tools. <laughs> right. But here's the thing, though, I, related to that is I don't know that I would have a lathe in my shop, but I would consider getting a three pack 
of carbide turning tools and keeping those. Don't you dare say use them on the drill press. Phil <laughs> right. <Huber. laughs> Robert. No, but saying that if I knew somebody yeah. that had a lathe, I would take my own tool turning tools over there. That's fair. Okay. I think that's fair. And that's a, to me, that is a more, I don't want to say, I, I want to say respectful, but I don't say it in that way. That is a good way to say, hey, I have my own tools. Can I use your lathe? Right. Like, to me, that's that's much easier because tools are the one thing that you could potentially damage. It's not sure. like you're really going to hurt a lathe. I mean, you can't really do much that's going to hurt a lathe. Right. Not without hurting yourself long before Correct. that. Correct. Correct. I guess I was also looking at it as not only that, but being the kind of, so it's being part of that community, but also being that kind of person that is generous with skills, um, camaraderie and tools that if somebody else didn't have a whatever, they could come over to my shop and use some tool that I had. Yeah. Hmm. You know, cause I've had a couple of friends of mine that have, that are more home improvement the home improvement end of woodworking and just needed the ability to cut down some plywood into square pieces with a clean cut and could do that or knew that I had a drill press and could use it to drill accurate square holes, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. So, okay. So here's a business idea. Okay. Um, a lathe rental business and we okay. call it lathe it and leave it maybe <laughs> no i mean it's uh, it's there. there are no bad ideas right uh, are it's there? a safe place hmm? yeah i mean and i that you know that kind of gets into the like group workshop maker spaces right. yeah sort of thing um but I'm sort of a cheapskate and I sometimes see the, you know, the per hour rates at some of those places. And it's, it's steep to me. Yeah. What to work there or yeah. to, to join them? Not just necessarily, even if, yeah, to join it, I guess, isn't too bad. Sure. But you know, like if you were to come in X dollars per hour or something yeah. like that. It's like joining a gym. It's like, I could just run yeah. outside for free, but I don't. But yeah. 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 Okay. And then I got to so, pack and, and all so my stuff that, up and go over there. And and it's meeting that need. You know, it's like the right person for the right thing, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. So. so I was actually just going to open up uh, one of the more recent issues of Hopwood, uh, the October issue. Okay. Um, because there is a, uh, there is a article in there by Keenan Oren. Um, he's down in uh, Kansas City, and he is part of the Kansas City Woodworkers Guild, I believe. And he, and they're awesome. Yes. Uh, yeah. And I know a lot of the guys from the Kansas City Woodworkers Guild, and I think we all do. Um, their shop is $100 per year, roughly, right. to join it and yeah. use it. And I would to do me, that in a flash. Oh, to me, Having been is, in their shop, yeah. Well, and like... Yeah, I mean, it's like, that's pretty freaking awesome. I mean, having the ability to have all the, yeah. you don't have the convenience of being able to walk out into your shop in your Crocs, but. But you could get have, in your car with your Crocs. You could get in your car with your Crocs <laughs> and drive there. But like not having, if you don't have the space, if you don't have the, um, I mean, yeah, if you can afford a hundred dollars a year, but you can't afford to buy machinery, that's perfect. Yeah. Or if you just don't want the space or you want to try it out, you know, it's yeah. try out woodworking. Like it's a, it's a pretty cool thing. Yeah. So. No, their, I, their setup is really sweet. It's, it's super cool. Yeah. And I know we had one here in Des Moines. I don't know if we still have it or not. Uh, we do area 515. Okay. Um, it looks like, I don't know what they have there. Yeah. Um, but it is 
forty dollars a month or four hundred and thirty a year. So yeah. you know, a little bit more. Um but you know, I guess it would sense. depend on what they have, you know, what you have access to. Yes, yes. And I think every one of them is gonna be a little different. Yeah. So anyway, it was just, you know, I appreciate the people that I work with here and their individual talents. I know that there was a, and I feel like it comes from like a professional trade mindset. Mm -hmm. and, and this is not meant as a slam. It's just the nature of it is, you know, it's like never asked to borrow my tools twice or something like that. Yeah. And, and I get it. Because if you're a professional, those tools are your livelihood. And if you're not going to invest in your own livelihood, then perhaps you need to find another one. But for hobbyists and considering the cost of entry on a lot of woodworking things, you know, being able to have a mindset of generosity is appealing to me. You know, am I going to give a novice, you know, one of my very finely tuned hand planes or something like that, or freshly sharpened chisels or something like that, just to use for the first time? You know, I don't know about that, but on the other hand, it just, they just need to be sharpened again. And you can maybe introduce somebody else to high performing tools. Yeah. See, and I'm... I'm going to give them my best tuned plane under my supervision. Right. <laughs> because then they're going to realize, like, it's it's funny because it's like when Colin was up here or down here last time, um, he's like, I've never used a block plane before. Or, yeah, like, I've never used a, I think, I think he said, I've never used a plane before. I was like, well, here you go. And he's like, oh, I see why people use these. It's like, yep, yes, you do. Now, if I would have handed you one of the planes out of the shop, your observation might have been a little different. Right. So. Not without spending a couple five minutes on sharpening the blade. What was that? Sorry. No, I was saying like if you, I mean, we would need to sharpen the blade because I know that it's one of those things oh, yeah. where community yeah. tools belong to nobody. Oh, gosh, yes. Well, it's like, yeah. You know, just that's... like using the drum sander, you wait until just after John changes the belt on it yep. and then. Boom, you start sanding a bunch of stuff. Fresh yeah. belt. Well, that's, that's what you've always said, fellas. It's like, if it's everybody's tool, it's nobody's tool. Yeah. So the only time, and to be fair, if I am grabbing one of the planes out of the shop, which I do occasionally, um, if, if I don't have mine, I will grab one of the planes out of the shop or one of the planes on our video set. Right. And if I'm going to use that, I do feel like it's my responsibility to sharpen it right. so I can use it. You know what I mean? Like, I don't I don't necessarily expect that I'm going to pick up a plane off the shelf and it's going to be ready to go. I'm expecting that I'm going to tear it apart, sharpen the blade, and then use it. Yeah. So, I don't know. It's just... Yeah. Unless I grab one of Steve Johnson's. Then I know it's going to be sharp. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then you better make sure that you don't. Oh, I do like it. Unsharpen I, it. No, and I do like a tape outline of where it was laying. So I know <laughs> it goes right back in the same spot. And then you sprinkle dust where all the yeah. tape peeled off the dust. Yeah. Hmm. So that's a good plan. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, which makes me think uh, we have, I don't know, bi monthly or every so often have uh, shop cleanup days where we all show up in the shop and do a massive clean. Maybe we should do a, a sharpening day where we all come in and group sharpen tools or. I feel like there are done. different levels of sharpening competence. Yes. Okay. Well, that's what I'm saying. Not, maybe that would teach the less competent maybe. to be more competent I could see that. and sharpen more mm -hmm. often and just be more mindful of the sharpening. That's fair. I'm, like, I'm speaking I'm of my not, when I'm referring to the less competent. I'm speaking of myself. So. No, I, I, I'm not naming any names. It's just I know there are some people that will get a tool very sharp. Steve yes. Johnson's very technical when it comes to sharpening. Right. 
I mean, I wouldn't um, come in and sharpen his tools and touch his no, tools. Yeah, no, yeah, right. Because <laughs> it would, like, bring down the average. They're, they would Although, be less than, less than sharp. I will say, uh, <laughs> I, I grabbed, um, we have the Veritas shooting plane in the shop. Okay, yeah. Okay. It, it's on a shop notes shooting board, I yep. think. Um, and it has, for the last couple of years, lived at Steve Johnson's bench. I grabbed it yesterday or two days ago to use for photos. I was amazed how dull it was. Oh, yeah? Uh, yeah. I, like, I don't know if somebody may have used because because it got moved from Steve's bench into the, the office. Oh, so if um, it, when we, somebody used it in between. Yeah, when we rejiggered the shop and moved that bench in and stuff. Right. Uh, so I don't know if somebody grabbed it and used it in between. But I was expecting that thing to be razor sharp. And I was like, oh, my God, I could use my toothbrush and it would cut better. Yeah. So. Hmm. But. All right. I can see that. Yep. Maybe a, that would be kind of fun to do like a group sharpen fest. Yeah. Long what ago. Would you name it, John? What? What would you name the, the group sharpen fest? <laughs> I don't know. I'll, I'll give you a few minutes. Yeah. We'll yeah. come back to that. <laughs> yeah. When I was in college, I started off uh, attending firefighting school, and part of that education was interning with a local fire department for a year. And the department that I was with had a every Saturday they called Star Day. So there were three shifts. So every third week, your shift was on Saturday. And on Star Day, you went through the whole station, cleaned everything, you know, vacuumed, cleaned bathrooms, mopped the garage floor, cleaned the trucks, which they've always, they always were clean anyway, but then, you know, ran through maintenance cycles on all the gear, you know, like starting up all the circle saws and checking all the ropes and gauges and whatever. So that, that's kind of why I've been trying to work with Chris on being a little bit more regular on cleaning up the shop. And for a while, when I was on shop notes, we had a, like, it was every Friday afternoon, we did a, like a clean the shop day, at least in the editor's section, mm -hmm. which is now Chris's CNC bat cave. Mm -hmm. That we would at least get that put back together. Cause it could, it, you know, yeah. When it's everybody's, it's nobody's. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The guys that are in the shop every day, all day, they do a good job of taking care of their yeah. stuff. It's us that come in there and do gorilla woodworking and we're in and out and <laughs> leave a mess or leave a tool laying around. And yeah. so it gets all of us back in there to, to clean up. Which is, it's funny. You know what I have noticed is that whenever Steve and Mark leave, their areas are very clean and the shop generally as a rule of thumb is very clean. Yeah. But I have noticed the more and more that I'm like kind of over in the photo studio working on projects for pop wood and stuff. And I'm in and out of the shop like during the day as they're working, it's not clean all the time. Like no. Steve, I'm not, I'm going to throw Steve under the bus. Sorry, Steve. Uh, like he was ripping a bunch of Walnut at the, uh, me? Yeah, no, it was him because your, your mid-century modern shelves are walnut, right? Yeah. Yep. John, he mm -hmm. was ripping a bunch of walnut and there was walnut dust all freaking over. <laughs> I mean, and you know, when, when the, when the saw stop gets a block in the dust line, it just shoots it straight back. Yeah. And it looks like, it looks like somebody sat there and like did a burnout with their tires and just there's <laughs> dust sprayed everywhere. And I'm like, hmm, this makes me feel a little bit better about when I'm in here when nobody else is in here yeah. and how messy it gets before I clean it up. Yeah. So, uh, so circling back to the, uh, group sharpening, there how about it is national honer society. That's yep. a good one. Maybe, I like yep. it. maybe I like okay. it. Okay. I think, I think that becomes a t-shirt. There you go. Mm -hmm. We yeah. just have a national has... sharpening day and it's, Yep. National, National Honors. Honors. Yeah, I like it. I like it, John. Okay. okay. All We're right. creating a movement here. Yep. Yep. It has mass appeal. It appeals to the hand tool guys. It appeals to the carvers. Yep. Yep. Okay. Sharpening around the world. Yep. 
So the other thing that I wanted to bring up, which is semi-related to this, is uh, the idea, you know, it's really easy to focus on when you're talking about woodworking tools is to think of them individually. Like, what can this tool do for me? Mm -hmm. um, and coming up with a list of its virtues and drawbacks or something. And I wonder if perhaps we need to consider a tool's relevance or capability in how well it relates to other tools. Okay. Woodworking being a team sport. So I was thinking like if we just brainstormed here a few ideas out of, on our own experience of you know, like you could easily do it in larger groups, but I was thinking, you know, like woodworking tool duos that, you know, one tool is better because of its relationship with another tool. For example, to start things off is I believe, and it's been my experience recently and how I've been working on some projects that a thickness planer's best friend is a bandsaw. Because they can share the load? Yeah, in the sense that I view the bandsaw as the tool that changes the thickness of a piece of wood. And I use the planer then to smooth that piece of wood, relatively speaking. Mm -hmm. You know, that the bulk of the thicknessing work is done at the bandsaw and its refinement is taken care of at the, at the thickness planer rather than, you know, taking eight quarter stock and grinding it down to, you know, an inch and a quarter. Yep. I think, uh, the jointer and planer are good partners as well. Right. I feel like this is a therapy session. Yeah, it is. Um, I think a router table works best with a router. I think that's a good pair. You know? <laughs> yep. Yeah, I do. I know what you mean. That's <laughs> a good team up. Uh, I will say that the shooting plane and board is best friends for the Meyer saw. Okay. Because at least in our shop, the Meyer saw does not make accurate cuts. Doesn't matter what you're right. doing. It doesn't. Especially it gets, it's written hard. Yeah. When you get, um, uh, you cut with the Meyer saw and it's close, but yes. it's hard to go back to the Meyer saw and take off. You right. know, a sliver a because then it yeah. de starts deflecting the blade and yep. you get a weird joint. So yep. it so. gets you close, but then. Well, and it was like for this humidor I'm working on, like doing miters for the, the sides and the top, it's like you get it close. You know, it might be like 47 degrees instead of 45 degrees, but shooting board makes that really accurate really quickly. Or a miter saw is best friends with a cock gun <laughs> you know I gets you know. close and then the yeah. cock gun <laughs> just finishes yep. it finishes yep. that joint just evens everything out yep okay well yeah there's that or i would say uh based on one of the christmas projects that i was working on uh spoke shave and a rasp Yes. Now, because the shaping that I was doing on this particular project had, it wasn't just, you know, a simple radius or following a curve. There was like a multiple curves or a complex profile. And there are just parts where, unless you're constantly switching directions with the spoke shave, you're going to end up getting tear out. Cause you like either crest the top of the hill and then, mm -hmm. Now you're going against the grain or you get to the bottom of a valley and start introducing tear out, you know, or depending on the material that you're working with, 
you know, whereas you can do a lot of the bulk shaping quickly with a spoke shave. And then in the complicated sections, use a rasp. See now to me, that almost, I don't know. Spoke shave leaves a nicer surface than a rasp. Oh, sure. For sure. So like I was going, I was thinking you were going to approach it the other way where it's like, yeah, beat the turd out of it with a rasp and then really smooth it off the spoke shave. Yeah. And that, and I've done that too, almost yeah. in the sense of like using a toothing plane. Yeah. And then following it up with a, with a smoother or a block plane. Yeah. Yeah. I'll say the Merca sander and a dust extractor. <laughs> yep. <clears throat> it does make a difference when you're not using a shop vac or dust extractor. Oh, okay. it does. It makes a huge difference. Yeah. But you have to have, and we have a bunch of old six inch sandpaper around the shop that does not match up to the Merca yeah, pattern. I've noticed that too. It's like, <laughs> and, where is all the bigger, is yeah. like that hidden or? Yeah, well, it's like. Do I use two uh, six inchers and or three and kind of space well, them out or? Well, it's like the, the six inch fit because it's a six inch sander. The six inch disc fits, but the holes are like in the center for like a Festool sander. Something, yeah. And I'm like, I mean, how bad can it be? It can be bad. You might as well just unplug the shot back. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. Yep, just preload the sandpaper. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, and not only does it like remove the sand of for the or not the sand, the the dust for the uh yeah. for making the mess and in in the air, it's it, it seems to uh sand better when that residue has been removed yeah. and sandpaper lasts longer and so mm -hmm. it's a good team up. It's a good duo. Speaking of Merca, I bought a pack of their, what is it, Abranet? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The mesh uh, discs to use with my non Merca sandpaper or sander. And mm -hmm. I was kind of surprised just having used it here, just used it on my, I have a Porter Cable random orbit sander and it makes a big difference with that too. Yeah. That, that is, the Abranet is a little more expensive, isn't it? Than like the Merca Gold, I think. Yeah. The, the mesh discs are definitely more yeah. expensive than regular discs. Yes. See, I, I'm, I don't know. I'm, but they work better in my opinion. See, and I was going to say I'm torn because I really like the Merca Gold or the Merca Iridium. Um, okay. The two that I buy. I I just have never I I don't feel like the mesh discs last as long, hmm. but I don't know that could just be me. Yeah. But because I mean, if you think about it, you're spraying that grit out quite a ways. Yeah. So each piece of grit is going to get wore down a little bit more to do the same amount of sanding. I don't know. You're you're going from like what eighty five percent ninety percent coverage with a standard disc. Yeah. Taking the holes into account down to, you know, like 50% coverage. I don't know. I just, I'm not sold on it. It works. It works great. It works better than department store sandpaper. Yeah. You know, but. Yeah. I'm I don't ever I don't get even... stuff, sandpaper from JCPenney's anymore. I was, was going to say Yonkers. I don't yeah. know why. <laughs> Big box store. Okay. Almost it, used John. up my supply from uh -huh. Montgomery Wards. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I <laughs> I almost said it too. Oh. <laughs> well, and I think I think part of it that I would counter that with is I feel like there's a lot of sandpaper now that is trying to match up everybody's hole size. Yeah. So it looks like it's been used as target practice for yep. birdshot and buckshot. Yep. And there's all these different size holes everywhere. And it's like, now how much have you lost because of that? Oh, yeah, for sure. Yep. Um, but admittedly, knowing that my Porter Cable sander isn't top of the line, sure. you know, going with the Abernet made a big oh, yeah. difference in how efficiently it works. Yeah. Well, it's it kind of goes back to something I was, I was talking to you about earlier, Phil, when we were standing in the spray booth. 
like there's there's certain, and we've talked about how you get what you pay for with some stuff. Sandpaper is one of those. Like, I don't care what anybody says, you cannot convince me Harbor Freight sandpaper is worth anything. I mean, it's <laughs> I've made the mistake of buying it before, and it's yeah. junk. Um, it, the same thing goes with finish. I think. Like, I was using yeah. some deft spray lacquer yesterday. And it was super nice stuff. It's expensive. Um, the, I got an issue where the, the aerosol was, the the lacquer in the can was so low that as I was spraying at an angle, it was just spraying aerosol. Um, but when I was at um, Menards last night, I was looking at the spray lacquer. And they had a couple different ones, like Verithane Minwax, um, Rust-Oleum, and Watco. Yeah, and the Watco is definitely more expensive, but God, it sprays so much nicer than the other ones. Like I have some Verithane stuff at home; it just wasn't very good. I don't know; wasn't mm-hmm. a huge fan. Yeah, I was using some, I think it was a can of Mohawk catalyzed yeah. lacquer, and that was just amazing, yeah. amazingly smooth and dry. That fast, was so. Mohawk. Is the they that used to be the Balens stuff? Okay, yeah, because mm-hmm. the can and looks they, a lot alike. Yeah, they rebranded it to the parent company with Mohawk finishing. But, yeah, they have – that spray catalyzed lacquer is amazing. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely use that on small projects at home. Yeah. Rather than bringing it in. It worked so well. All right. Any other combos? I mean, we can go, like, really obvious and, like, one cannot exist without the other. Like, if you have a lathe – and you use high speed duels, you're gonna have a grinder. Sure. You know, or I don't know. Router table and router. <laughs> Johnson. Drill pass <laughs> and drill bits. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hmm. yeah. But I got I got no others that are that jump out to me. Because I think you had once said once about like a bandsaw and a lathe. Yeah, well, I mean that's yes, yes, that is true. Now it's not completely necessary. No, I could I could grab a log and throw it on the lathe and turn a bowl out of it. It's just going to take a whole lot longer than if I have the bandsaw. Right. So kind of like you said, the bandsaw is a good complement in your opinion to the the planer. planer. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I would I would almost say. A drum sander goes with the planer pretty well. Okay. Because there is some times where, uh, for example, this humidor I'm working on right now, uh, I can plane down to about a quarter of an inch. I think technically our planer will go down to three sixteenths, but get it close and then really sneak up it on it on the drum sander mm-hmm. because the drum sander says that much more control and it gives me a much better service depending on how recently John changed the sandpaper. <laughs> yes. So, That's yeah. the key. Yeah, I've noticed yeah. that too, that having the drum sander to really hone in on a very specific thickness is nice. Because when you're using the planer, it's like you're going down from five eighths and you're trying to get to a half and you get within like a thousandth yeah. of an inch. And if you send it through the planer again, it's going to go down to three eighths all of a sudden. Exactly. So it's nice yeah. to, you know, just take those hundreds, last hundreds of an inch off and just really hone in. Or after in you've on. glued up a panel and you know that the grain direction yeah. is not consistent. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, helps in those when you get to the chip out and all that stuff too. Yeah. Or yeah, if you've glued up a panel and you're trying to get every bit of thickness out of it that you can, and you know if you send it through the planer, you're going to take way too much off. Or it's just too wide to go through the planer. That too, yeah. Like we our our drum sanders are open-ended, so I think technically you can get like, is it a 24-inch drum on it? Yeah. So you can get like almost 48 inches of sanding, like mm-hmm. 46, probably 44. So. Yeah. And I think the, what's our planer? 15 inches? 15. 15. Yeah. 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 I've designed things around that, that it's like, <laughs> I'm only going to get about 15 inches wide here. So that's we're going to have to go smaller. So. Yeah, that's fair. Um, I will say one other combo that I, I've, I've I don't want to sound super commercially, but. I have fallen fallen madly in love with the Panto router, 
Like, and I, as much as I hate to say it, and I'm sorry, Mac, if Mac listens to this from Panto Router, I just was, when it, when it first got here, I'm like, okay, whatever. This is like, this is stupid. I'm not stupid, but like, it's, <laughs> it seems like a solution looking for a problem. Yeah. Like, like an over, direct, over the top solution. Yes. Like more direct ways to do something like a Rube Goldberg type thing. Like, you know what? I don't need to flick this light switch on to put toast in a bread in a toaster and make it toast. Um, I freaking have fallen, fallen in love with it. Like I really, really like how easy it is to set up once you understand it. But with that being said, it's a router router. Generally routers generally make a lot of dust but you hook that stupid thing up to a dust extractor and it is unbelievably clean. So I'm going to say the Panther router with a dust extractor. Like one cannot exist without the other. Okay. Well, I guess you could have a dust extractor without the Panther router. <laughs> Panther router cannot exist. But a dust, it a dust <laughs> extractor doesn't make tenons quite as well. Without it does. The, it's yeah. very hard. It takes hard. a long it time. Takes, yeah. <laughs> uh, too funny yeah. yeah so in the hand tool world is there any tools that you'd say are companions that, i mean you said you said spoke shave and rasp yeah and i get that i agree with that and i'd, I'd throw a third in there to make it a make it a super friends trio and put a card scraper okay okay because i think depending on depending on the coarseness of your rasp you could go from, you know, and depending on the order, you could you, a spoke a card scraper will clean up the surfaces of both of those tools, you know, because yes. sometimes a spoke shave can be a little bit more faceted than you would like, mm -hmm. and with a card scraper you can quickly remove those facets without removing a ton of material. Mm -hmm. So. Which rasps were you using? Um, I have, I don't know if they call it a hand cut rasp. It's from Lee Valley. Okay. Let me, uh, cause that, that was going to be another one that I was going to say is a, you get what you pay for. Anybody that has ever been like these rat, like even that's ever had a port experience with a rasp has not used a good rasp. Right. Because the hand-stitched rasps are phenomenal when compared to the machine-stitched ones. Right. Just because the machine-stitched ones' teeth are in rows, so you kind of get in these weird, like, you create these really deep grooves that don't, they limit the teeth from cutting. But when you find a hand-cut one, the teeth are literally hand-stitched. So you're somebody sitting there with a chisel and a hammer and stitching each tooth in, so it's all irregular, um, and had they cut so much better. Yeah. Uh, I have, I have a couple of the karate, I believe. Okay. They're Italian. Um, they are actually machine cut, but they have a random tooth pattern. They, they are phenomenal. Um, and so are the, uh, is it the Ario rasp? Are Ario? you? Yeah. Are you? Oreo from yes. Oreo rasp. Yeah. Yes. They go really good with a glass of milk. Yeah, I have the ones from Lee Valley. These are, it, they're calling them hand cut. They're made in the Czech Republic. Okay. And they have a, like a ribbed plastic handle on it. 35 bucks currently. Gotcha. Um, so, cause I was looking for something not super pricey. Cause I don't, I don't use a rasp all the time, but I want a, a decent one. But I also have a coarse one that has that's machine cut, knowing that I just want that thing to remove wood. Sure. And the surface it leaves behind is Doesn't nowhere matter. close my, to my final surface. So uh, this half I got the half round one from Lee Valley, and it that's it. The surface is relatively smooth that I can go to a card scraper or like a file very yeah. fast and remove and clean that up. So it's not, I'm not spending a lot of time on that. So, yeah. Yeah. The ones I use are the, I have the Corradi. It's C O R R A D I. They're made in Italy. 
Um, and you can you can tell looking at them that there is a pattern on the tooth because they are machine cut, but it's a random. It's not a random pattern, but it's a pattern that emulates um, like a hand stitched one. Uh, sure. So uh, they're they're pretty awesome. Yeah, you can you can remove a surprising amount of material, but be left with a really nice surface. So, so yeah. Other hand tools, I would say. Uh, I'm still gonna go with the shooting board and the handsaw. Okay. Yeah. Like it doesn't matter what handsaw. Whatever it is, anything you're cross cutting. It needs a shooting board with it. Okay. That's legit. Mm -hmm. I would say a set of chisels and a router plane. Yeah. Yeah. That's fair. Yeah. You could go bracing bits with um, mortise chisels. I have. I mean, a mortise chisel will take out a mortise. All yeah. waste by itself, but it's a whole lot easier if you drill it out first, yeah, and then chop it. Uh, all right, then let's wrap this up with uh, any you guys got any projects you're working on? I am in like a hurry up and wait type situation on <laughs> moving, <laughs> it's kind of like just waiting around to pack up when it's time. Don't make a mess, <laughs> don't touch anything, don't break anything. That's so, you guys like eat eating your way down through all your food. That, yeah. I started, I was working on that last night. I was like, well, we got a little bit of these tater tots left. Let me throw those in the <laughs> air fryer and yep. using up all the stuff and get the, so. get the frozen stuff all eaten. And yep. Yep. That's to move. So, but after we move, I'm sure I'm going to have all kinds of new projects. So looking forward to that. Yeah. Do we decide, are you going to take this one wall workshop? You guys said that, but I like I don't even know like He doesn't he didn't even look I, at the garage. Yeah, I looked at it. <laughs> right. This house has a garage. I'm pretty sure that has, I'm yeah, has a garage, but I don't know how I'm gonna set it up. It's like I'm gonna dump everything from my garage in there and then figure it out from there. Right. Well so. it has your name on it, so you okay. have to take care of it when the time comes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I don't I know what to, that means. I have, yet, to, I have but... to foster it and yes. raise it into a multi wall workshop. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Until you're ready to release it back into the universe. Yep. Yep. Okay. That's fair. Yeah. So that's my situation. Just waiting. Okay. Well but I mean, technically Steve's working on one of your projects. Yes. Right? Yes. So, so has he come griping at you to finish your drawings yet? Uh, I've, well, I've, they're fairly well done. I'm waiting for him to ask for more information on stuff, but okay. I fed him to Slowly. at least through the end of this week for sure. I'm sure okay. there's going to be more questions <laughs> at some point, but okay, we'll see. All right. Well, I'm better part of three quarters of the way done with the humidor so um been talking about that one for a long time it just kind of has got punted down the road until what three weeks from issue ship so it's like yeah let's just knock about the last quarter of the issue get it done yeah so um yeah it's uh, i mean going sometimes i'm like i don't know what to do when something goes right it's like what what's gonna happen <laughs> yeah like <laughs> Is this a trap? Why is it working? It's a trap. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Wait for something to just blow up. Like the phone to uh, ring. Guess what? Yeah. yeah. Um, but no, it's, I mean, it's, like I said, I, I, it's going together exactly how I wanted. Uh, I don't know what else to say about it. I, miters are stupid. I will say that just as a general blanket statement. Um, and working with lumber that you have scorched the sides on before you start building with it, it presents a couple problems because you're introducing a lot of stresses into the wood. Sure. And then everything you touch is black for the next three days. And then the workbench that is in the photo studio is staying black for the next year. Yeah. Um, but uh, overall it's coming together really well. Um, some of it, <laughs> this is kind of how I build stuff. I, I kind of make it up as I go. And then I hand it to John and say, John, can you draw this for me? <laughs> Reverse engineer this. <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> So it's like, 
I there's a bunch. This is kind of a deeper dive that I want to take. But there's a bunch of different cigar sizes, and most cigar humidors are sized for like a, a you know this is a 25 humidor or a 50 to 70 humidor or 70 to 150 humidor. So it's like counts the number of cigars it could hold. But there are a lot of different cigar sizes. There's different ring gauges, so the diameter of a cigar, and there's different lengths. Um, the biggest, there's always exceptions, but most of the biggest cigars that are standard size are eight inches. Most are like a Churchill size, which is a seven inch cigar. So I size the inside of the box for a seven inch cigar. Um, it's like seven and a half inches long or deep. Um, but I don't really know how many cigars it's going to hold until I <laughs> load it up. So it's like some of it, I'm kind of like, yeah, we're just kind of flying by the seat of my pants <laughs> mm -hmm. on. But I think it'd be cool. It's like I, the only things I have left to do. So the box bottom is done. It's lined with Spanish cedar. Um, the top is not glued up yet because I'm still working on lacquer on the panel on it. Um, but that will get glued up before I leave today. Uh, and then the only thing that I have left to do is a tray for the interior. Um, so it'll be like a lift out tray. And then I'm going to do kind of like I did on the toolbox, some inlet lid storage. So there'll be the humidor or the humidistat, the humidifier, uh, unit. And then I'm also going to include a, uh, I haven't decided if it's going to be like a, uh, magnet to hold in the cigar cutter and the lighter. And then a couple of little cigar stands, um, kind of little cross cigar stands. Um, so, yeah, that will be kind of cool. I'm excited to have it done. Yeah. Nice. So, yeah, it's been a project that I've talked about building for years now. So, Sweet. Yeah. I just wrapped up uh, a rehab on a wood mallet that I made years ago. Shop notes number two, and I posted this on our Instagram account, had a, they called it a joiner's, joiner's mallet. And it has a laminated head so that they could add some weight in it. And back then they used like lead weights or shot and then encased it in epoxy and then glued on the sides of the mallet head. And uh, for a while we offered it as a kit where you could basically assemble it yourself and do all the shaping. And I had done that shortly after starting at Woodsmith, but I had some skills that I needed to learn yet. And it, it didn't, it worked. It was a solid mallet. And, uh, I don't remember what I was doing and it just started to fall apart on me. The maple faces of the mallet kind of wore out and, then it just split apart. So I kept the handle and remade the head with hickory, still with the steel weights on the inside that came with the kit and just paid a lot more attention to glue surfaces and tight joints and everything. And I, and then I reshaped the handle. Cause I think at the time I just used like chisels and a jackknife or something like that and some sandpaper and uh, it's like a whole new tool. So it's kind of fun. Then I'm also working on a couple of lamps for Christmas gifts. I Christmas gifts that I'm working on and a couple of little carving projects too. Just cause it's fun. Cool. Awesome. So what's next? Because I know you always have something <laughs> in the hopper, Phil. Well, and the funny part was, is a few weeks ago, I w we were trying to, we were getting to this part of the show and I was, I don't know admittedly I was feeling a little lost. Like I just didn't know what my projects were or I don't know, like a shop funk. You've talked about that before. Yep. And then now all of a sudden I have like four going on and I'm like, you know what I want to do now also is throw a couple of more spoons in there. And <laughs> I want to make a little organizer for that uh, radio cabinet that I rehabbed because yeah. the inside is just two doors and it's open. And I'd like to put, have something in there to hold bookmarks and pens and pencils and a pad of paper or something like that. Okay. So there's that. And then, uh, I have the 
shave horse that we did from Woodsmith. Mm -hmm. And it does great on a lot of stuff, but sometimes kind of falls down when it comes to working on spoons or bowls. So there's an attachment that I want to add to it called a spoon mule. Okay. That I want to make for it. So is it a mule instead of a horse <laughs> because it's smarter and more well thought out? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So so there's that. Um and then I still have my router mortiser that I've kind of set aside now because I had finished it routed some sample mortises and I have some funkiness in there that I'm just not happy with. So I'm halfway between just chucking it and skipping the idea altogether or trying to figure out what I need to do to make this a better, a better tool. Okay. So there you go. Yeah. You know, what's kind of fun is all of my projects now, well, not all of them, but like most of my projects that I'll be building from now on are just like driven by the magazine and what I need to build for the magazine. <laughs> but it's cool because all those magazine projects are ones that I've wanted to build anyways, and I just put them in the schedule. See? Yep. There you go. It's kind of awesome. It works yeah. out great. It's called management. <laughs> it's, <laughs> yeah. Now if I could just get somebody to build them for me, that'd be awesome. Yeah. There you go. Although that would take out all the fun. So. Yeah. All right, so that takes care of another episode of the Shop Notes podcast. Thanks for listening. If you have any questions, comments, or smart remarks, we'd love to hear from him, from you. You can email us, woodsmith at woodsmith.com, or you can leave them in the comments section on our YouTube channel where you can watch uh, this version of the episode as well. Uh, don't forget to check out our show notes page at woodsmith.com slash podcasts. I want to remind you, today's episode is brought to you by Shaper Tools. They're the makers of that Shaper Origin. It's the handheld CNC that takes digital precision and marries it to the craft of woodworking. There's all kinds of things you can do with it. Joinery, cabinetry, hardware installation, more, all of it. Just do it all with speed and precision. And they have a special offer now where you can try it in your shop for 30 days. Just visit shapertools.com to learn more. Thanks, everybody, and we'll see you next week. They should name them Hot Pockets. I want to note for the record that Logan is a, is eating in his office and he didn't bring enough for nope. the whole class. <laughs>